This video was made with support from my patrons, whose names are on screen now. If you want to, you can join them today and even get access to exclusive content. The link to my Patreon is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, on with the show. If you play through a Gran Turismo game, there will always be certain cars that stick in your mind. Maybe it's a car that you used quite often, or one you were given to use for a specific event, or even a car you came up against as an opponent that was particularly memorable for some reason. It's not surprising, given the sheer number of cars to have featured in this series, that a few will become legendary. But quite often, these are for reasons which the developers hadn't really anticipated. This video is a follow-up to my Gran Turismo meme cars video, which I'd recommend watching if you haven't already, in which I explain the origins of some of the most well-known and interesting cars that have become memes in the GT community. But the truth is that there are many cars throughout the history of Gran Turismo that aren't necessarily memes, but are memorable for very specific reasons. The thing about Gran Turismo games, particularly the older titles, is that any given person's experience of playing through the game can be drastically different from the next person's. Now, there will be shared experiences, but depending on which game you play, which events you do, and of course which cars you decide to drive, you're very unlikely to experience everything the game has to offer in a single playthrough. So what I'm going to do is take you through a generalised experience of playing through a Gran Turismo game, and some of the interesting and just downright bizarre situations you may come across. And in most cases, the cars are key to that situation. Ready? Okay, these are Gran Turismo's most infamous cars. Let's dive in. So, what's the first thing you're likely to do after being plopped down into GT World? Probably use the limited amount of credits you've been given to buy your first car, a defining moment in any GT playthrough. Unless you're playing GT2 or GT4, you're most likely going to have to settle for a bit of a shit box. But it's your shit box that you chose, and that's what's important. And it's a big deal which car you choose because that will define a lot about your early playthrough, such as which events you can race in. Gran Turismo 6 has the most cars of any of these games, almost 1300 by the end of its life cycle. So you might expect that the 30,000 credits you've been given, a very generous amount by GT standards, could open up many opportunities in terms of a starter car. And that would be true, if you weren't forced to spend most of that on a Honda Fit RS. So taking away all player choice from the situation, really. You know, forget Mount Chiliad or whatever, to me, this is the biggest mystery in video game history. Hey, that rhymed. How did they think this was a good idea? Maybe they were worried that people would get overwhelmed by the options and pick a really bad car by accident. But 30 grand is a lot of money, and GT6 is piss easy, so that shouldn't be a problem. Also, they could have just recommended the fit, they didn't have to force it on you, or just reduce your starting credits so you had much fewer options. Whichever way you look at it, it's just a really odd decision, and more than anything, tallies with the fact that by GT6, it seemed like Polyphony didn't really care about the single player experience anymore. But speaking of bad starter cars, how about the Mazda Demio? The first gen Mazda Demio, known as the Mazda 2 outside of Japan, is legendary in Gran Turismo. And that's for a few reasons. One is that it features in the first license test of the original Gran Turismo. So for many people, this was the very first car they ever drove in these games. Another is that in almost every GT game, it's always an option as a starter car. But the truth is that you'd only really pick it if you didn't know that much about cars. There were always much better options, which were often even cheaper than the Demio. But don't think you can escape the Demio that easily, because again in GT1, it was actually given out as a prize car for the first event in the game, the Sunday Cup. And not just a regular Demio, but a tuned Master Speed Demio A-Spec. Despite that, it's still quite slow, but what's funny is that in 2022, a real-life racing series in the UK, called the MSVT Turismo X, actually offered a real first-gen Demio as a prize car, in homage to Gran Turismo. Not an A-spec, sadly, just a basic Demio, which was maybe the reason why it struggled to attract competitors, and the series was scrapped for 2023. Anyway, within Gran Turismo, the Demio A-spec's actual claim to fame is that when upgraded, it has a truly bizarre engine sound. I don't know what you expect me to add to that, it kind of just speaks for itself. Literally. After you've bought your first car, you might be tempted to jump straight into the racing, but not so fast. 
In most GT games, there will be a handful of events you can do right off the bat, but you're still going to need to get your licenses if you want to progress further. The license tests are an iconic part of Gran Turismo. Without them, it would feel like something is missing, but that's not to say they're all good. Part of the experience of doing license tests is failing at license tests, usually in quite frustrating ways. Everyone has that memory of being stuck on a specific test in one of these games. For me personally, it was test International B7 from GT3, a slalom at Complex String in a Roof RGT with the assists forced off. No matter how hard I tried as a kid, I could never pass it. The same was true for R6 in the Rally License. Of course, we could talk about particularly difficult tests forever. There was no shortage of them in the older Gran Turismos, but there's one car that I want to single out as having two of the hardest license tests in Gran Turismo history from two separate games. And amazingly, they weren't even from late game licenses, nor were they even the final tests within their respective license. That car in question is the Chevrolet Camaro Z28 Coupe, otherwise known as the PTSD Camaro. You'll see why in a second. Firstly, with GT2, we have test IC3, in which you have to navigate two 90 degree left handers. Not too difficult, but then IC4 has us doing the same thing, but with walls on either side, meaning you can't carry as much speed, and it's much more difficult to judge as they're now blind corners. It is brutally difficult, given the clear times are the same as IC3, requiring almost perfect inputs and timing if you're trying to get gold. Funnily enough, it's not even the hardest test in GT2's International C license. That credit goes to IC9, in which the demo replay showing you how to do it doesn't even manage to get gold itself. Now, that does overshadow IC4, but there's one key difference. IC9 can be cheesed very easily. Hey, someone should tell Polyphony and they might be able to finally gold it themselves. Moving on to GT3, the Camaro returns in license A7 at Seattle. Again, the focus is 90 degree corners, but just one this time, and once again it is ball-crushingly difficult to get gold. I must admit that I find 90 degree corners at street circuits fairly natural, so after a few attempts I could get the line down and gold it with not too much difficulty. But the margin for error in this test is very small, a lot smaller than what you'll find in other tests, including most of the later licenses. If you use reverse shifting, which is the act of just tapping the reverse button at high revs to change upper gear whilst not losing much acceleration, that can also make this test a bit easier. Without reverse shifting, the world record for this test is just over a tenth below the gold time. That should tell you just how fine the margins are. With many other tests, it's more about the challenge of putting together a clean and fast run rather than being inch perfect. To me, that's what sets these Camaro tests apart from the rest. So, with that said, on the other side of the spectrum we have something like S5 from GT6, in which you have a one lap time trial at Ascari Race Resort in a Bugatti Veyron. In contrast, the fastest time I could find for this one is more than 10 seconds below the goal time. Of course it is a much longer test, but even in percentage terms that is a massive difference. So, that might lead you to believe that this test is quite easy. And from numbers alone, you could make that argument, but that still doesn't explain why so many people struggled with this test. I remember seeing the comments at the time, just how frustrated people were getting because they couldn't get gold. Was it just a case of them not knowing or forgetting how hard the test used to be? Maybe, but I think there's another reason. So, we have this high-power hypercar at this really technical track. From a lot of these comments, it seemed like people felt they couldn't push the car anymore, they had reached the ceiling of what was possible. The obvious issue was understeer. You can't really drive past understeer or use it in a beneficial way like you can with oversteer. It can just feel like a limitation. But if you watch these fast times, they're very forceful with how they push the car into the corners, in some places four-wheel drifting with smoke pouring off the tyres. It's not exactly conventional, and to me, this is where the skill gap comes from. You have to drive the car in a very unnatural way to get the best times from it. Given the odd car and track combination, I guess that's not too surprising. So, rather than the time requirement being the challenge, the real challenge is the car itself. I remember the first few times I tried it and could barely keep the thing on the track. It just wouldn't turn, but after a few laps I understood and beat the time easily. They often say that you don't want to fight the car, you should let it move naturally to get the most speed out of it. In this particular situation, that is completely wrong. 
you have to fight the car into doing what you want it to, and to me, this is why there was such a discrepancy in the times between the people who couldn't do it but felt like they were driving on the limit, and those who could clear it with seconds in hand. As you can see, a huge difference from the Camaro tests, but they cause PTSD all the same. So, now you've got your licenses, it's finally time to race. And that means you'll encounter the AI opponents. Let's be honest, the AI in Gran Turismo has never been great. In more recent games, it's about how slow and unaware they normally are, and in the older games, they're a lot more exciting and raceable, with the caveat that they're completely out of control most of the time. GT2 in particular showcases this quite well. Places like the Corkscrew at Laguna Seca, Turn 1 at Grand Valley, and Turn 4 at Seattle always screw them up. And at pretty much every other circuit, there will be at least one place where they routinely drive off the track or straight into a wall. It's not pretty, but what did you expect in those early days? The series would then move on to the PS2 hardware, starting with GT3, and with this came an upgrade to the AI, something which Polyphony was certainly keen to hype up. Ooh, emotion physics. What the hell does that mean? But even if the improvements over GT2 were clear in this area, there were a few things which didn't change. Despite the carnage in GT2, whenever I think of AI fails in Gran Turismo, I think of the Shelby Cobra in GT3. And specifically, the Shelby Cobra at Laguna Seca. Given that it's an American car and an American track, you tend to find it there very often. And it's not just the corkscrew, which can catch out other cars, but also Turn 1 and the final corner prove to be big obstacles for it. It is a very fast car, especially in the Beginner League Stars and Stripes event, but due to its tendency to self-immolate, it's rarely ever your main challenger. The mix of big power, low weight, and 1960s engineering all result in a spectacular downfall of GT3's advanced AI. Emotion physics can't save you now, bitch. But another side effect of that is how it chews through rubber in events that feature tyre wear. In the Seattle Circuit 100 miles endurance race, where it can again come up as an opponent, it can manage a total of, get this, two laps before it has to pit for tyres. Two laps. Why even bother racing at that point? Just leave the car in the pits and take a ride on the Space Needle or something. What a waste of time. Moving on to GT4, the AI were again a little bit more refined, but still capable of doing the big stupid. Even still, the Cobra was much improved as an opponent, including at Laguna Seca, and was even quite formidable in a few events. Although that wasn't just down to the driving. In a few events for specifically classic cars, the Cobra is easily the class of the field. For instance, the World Classic Car Series, where, along with the tuned Buick Special, it can lap 10 to 20 seconds faster than the other opponents. And the same is true in the 1000 Miles events. Whether or not the Cobra shows up as an opponent massively changes the difficulty of the events, which has happened before in Gran Turismo, but the Cobra in GT4 is probably the most extreme example of this I can remember outside of something we'll talk about later. Its appearance in GT4 couldn't be much more different to GT3, with the exception of its tyre life which is still terrible. What's interesting is that the Cobra in these classic car events isn't the Shelby Cobra, but rather the AC Cobra. It's pretty much the same car but weighs quite a lot more than the Shelby, and apparently that makes it far easier to drive. To me, the Cobra perfectly sums up the dichotomy of AI opponents in Gran Turismo. Stupid, and stupidly fast unacceptable, and unbeatable. As you continue onwards in your Gran Turismo journey, you will come across One Make Races, race events for specific makes and models of cars. These were first introduced in GT2 and have been a staple of the series ever since. In their first iteration they were quite basic, just a single race at a randomly chosen track with a small payout, but as the series moved forward they would begin to increase in scope. In GT3, they became fully-fledged multiple race events integrated into the main career mode. These even included full championships, with the Vitz Race Championships being by far the most infamous. Check out my Meme Cars video for a full breakdown of why that is. But for me, when I picture one-make races in Gran Turismo, I think of GT4. And part of that is down to sheer numbers. Let me put it this way. In GT4, there are more one-make events than there are events in the Beginner League, Professional League, Extreme League, American events, European events, or Japanese events combined. 
And unlike GT2, these aren't short one race events. Most of them are multiple races, sometimes even five race championships taking almost an entire hour to complete. And the events themselves can feel like a lottery. The ones that have become the most well known are for their difficulty. The 206 Cup for the Peugeot 206 is one such example. Whilst most one make events in GT4 have stock or lightly tuned opponent cars, the 206 Cup has heavily tuned opponents, meaning that a stage 3 turbo kit and racing tyres are pretty much a must just to keep up. I feel bad for people who got a 206 in their playthrough and decided to give this event a go, only to be beaten to a bloody pulp. And unless they want to spend several times what the car is even worth in upgrades, they've got no chance. The only upside is that you can cheese the events by using the 206 World Rally car, but given the cost, you'll have to wait until much later in your playthrough. But probably the most infamous event in GT4 is the Opel Speedster Trophy. Basically, take what I said about the 206 Cup and jack it up another level. The opponent cars are not just heavily tuned, but impossibly tuned. They are more powerful than what you as a player can achieve, meaning that you will almost always get maximum A-spec points for winning it. This sort of artificial difficulty was quite common in, say, GT2, but in GT4 it really is an anomaly. You know it's tough when the Gran Turismo wiki has not only a strategy section for this event, but a strategy section with this much information. One positive is that the AI's fallibility does sometimes come through, which makes it a bit easier, but it's still anything but a walkover. Now, the question that has to be asked is why were these events in particular made so difficult? I think this is most likely down to the prize cars you receive from them. The 206 Cup grants you the 205 T16 Group B Rally car, and for the Speedster Trophy, the Calibra DTM car. Pretty awesome prizes that almost make them worth the trouble. And that's the point. It seems like they wanted to give out these prize cars, but realised that if these events were a normal level of difficulty, they would be completely broken and an easy ticket into some really fast cars. Of course, they could have just given worse prizes for them, but jacking up the difficulty was the solution they went with instead. However, not every event follows that same line of thinking. The Stars of Pleiades is a Subaru one-make event where you come up against some lightly tuned Impreza's and Legacies, and as well as a healthy championship bonus, you can win the Impreza Super Touring Car, which is fast and versatile given that in GT3 and 4 you can even drive it on dirt and snow. In this case, the prize car is not at all proportional with the difficulty of the event, which is fairly easy. Albeit you do need an IB license to enter, this still means that the event can be done fairly early into a playthrough. All of this is to say that when it comes to Gran Turismo, despite the name, not all one-make races are created equal. Now, depending on the game, there will come a time when you're a bit strapped for cash. Maybe you're saving up for a particular car or whatever, but the bottom line is that you need money fast. Money making methods are always popular in these games. Be it GT7 with the three best paying races added post launch specifically for grinding, to GT6 and the Red Bull X2014 Standard Championship again added in an update. People are always on the lookout for replayable events which earn the most money. And these money making methods have existed for pretty much as long as Gran Turismo itself. If we go back to GT2, we can find a pretty ridiculous one. In GT2, you have the ability to win multiple prize cars by simply replaying a race, and this can be very easily exploited. One very well-known method is to win the fifth race of the 80 Sports Car Cup at Tahiti Road. This can be done using even a starter car, such as the Skyline R32 GTST with minor upgrades. You will need an International B license to compete, but the race itself isn't too hard and only takes about 4 minutes to finish. And yet winning this single race gives you the Nissan R30 Skyline Silhouette race car. And if you want to, you can repeat it, selling each Skyline for 125,000 credits a pop. But you could take it even further. By taking the R30 silhouette to the third race of the Gran Turismo All-Stars event at Red Rock Valley, which is again not too difficult and only takes about 6 minutes, you can win the TVR Speed 12, which can be sold for half a mil. In addition to the 50,000 credits you get for winning the race, that is 550,000 credits in only 6 minutes, which equates to over 91,000 credits per minute, or almost 5.5 million credits per hour. 
I don't think there will ever be a money-making method as busted as this ever again. And with GT3, they understandably toned it down massively. You now need to win all the races in a single race event, which is at least three, or a full championship to receive a prize car, with the exception of much longer endurance races. And once you've won a prize car, you can't win it again, except for endurance races or championships, which give you a random roulette of four possible cars. The championships can be safe scum to get the car you want, but that is time consuming. But then we come to GT4. With GT4, they reversed their decision, and now you have the ability to clear your completion from events to complete them again and earn another prize car. And this can be done continuously, just like GT2. And again, this was quickly exploited. The most famous method is to complete the Capri Rally easy, which takes roughly 10 minutes, maybe less if you use a faster car, and can be done fairly easily, given you'll be up against Lancia Deltas and Toyota Celicas. The prize is a Toyota RSC Rally Raid car, which can be sold for 265,000 credits. Plus the 10,000 you get for winning the two races means you can earn roughly 27,500 credits per minute, or 1.65 million per hour. This method is again so useful because it can be done so early into your playthrough. You only need a National A license, and the opponents, as I've said, are nothing special. You might even be able to beat them in your starter car. And if you're struggling, you can take advantage of the layout of Costa de Amalfi and just wall ride the corners. There are far better money making methods in this game, most taking advantage of B spec, where the car is driven for you and you can increase the speed by times three. But most of these can only be done later in the game with the required cars. The Capri Rally can be done almost immediately, so it's not surprising that it became so legendary. From GT5 onwards, they again removed the ability to repeatedly win prize cars for good, so it's unlikely that this sort of thing will ever happen again. Even still, we can look back at these methods fondly, in particular the Toyota RSC, which became a legend in the Gran Turismo community without even turning a wheel. Well, by this point in your playthrough, you're probably starting to get into some of the tougher events, such as ones featuring race cars. Gran Turismo has featured many real-world race cars, but also plenty of fictional ones as well. This is a remnant of the early days of Gran Turismo, when they couldn't get the licenses to use many of these real race cars, so they just made their own. A lot of the time based on real-life race cars, but sometimes their own original creations. And this practice has been carried through to current day. You'll find plenty of fictional racing variants in Groups 3 and 4, for instance. Groups 3 and 4 are equivalents to the real-life GT3 and GT4 regulations, and as such, the fictional cars that have been made for them will fit in line with these also. Well, almost. Whilst most of these made-up racing cars are designed using a real car as a basis, what if some of them weren't? What if they were designed from some radical concept cars instead? Enter Vision GT. I've covered Vision GT in depth in its own video, talking about its origins, the concepts it's produced, and the overall reception. But what I want to talk about now are the race cars, particularly the ones that have been adapted to Group 3 regulations. On one end of the scale, we have something like the Toyota FT1 Vision GT. From conception, it's basically just a race car version of the FT1 concept car, so it was slotted into Group 3 very easily by just altering its performance without having to fundamentally change the design of the car. But the same cannot be said for something like the original Peugeot Vision GT car. It's an almost 900 horsepower, four-wheel drive, futuristic hypercar, which they've tried to turn into a GT3 racer. It reminds me of the Veyron, which they forced into Group 4 with a detuned engine, but when fully upgraded, it still makes less power than the road car. Wonderful. Points for effort, but this was always going to be a bit weird. It kind of completely defeats the point of the original car to homogenise it to a common rule set like GT3, given that its specs are now completely different, but okay. I just think it's amazing that you can look at the original car without any side windows and think, huh, that's funny, but in the context of a modern day GT3 race car, it is downright hilarious. In classic Vision GT fashion, it still has no interior, meaning that it is the only Group 3 car in GT7 to not have one. But a Vision GT car that does have an interior is the Volkswagen GTI Vision GT, which again was made into a Group 3 race car. The GTI comes in two forms, the Super Sport and the Roadster, so logically they base the race car on the one that doesn't have a roof. Yep. If the Peugeot was downright hilarious, I don't even know what they were thinking here.
Much like the Peugeot, the original Vision GT car it's based on is four-wheel drive, but to fit with Group 3 regulations, it's been converted to rear-wheel drive. It's also apparently now mid-engined. That's despite the original car being front-engined, as shown in official illustrations, and the car still retaining the vents on the hood, which are now presumably just for show. It just seems like they kinda winged it on this one. Why does it need to be mid-engined? Why couldn't it just be FR? Who knows? So many things about this car are just weird. But did you know that there was a Group B rally car version of the Super Sport originally planned to be in GT Sport? Despite that actually making sense, they scrapped it. Yet the Group 3 Roadster Abomination was deemed worthy. Somehow. But maybe these cars were made out of necessity, as manufacturers need to have a car in both Group 3 and 4 to take part in the Manufacturer's Cup. Well, no. Peugeot also had an RCZ-based Group 3 race car, which looks awesome and is actually designed like a midship car, might I add. And for Volkswagen, there was a car based on the Beetle. It's not much better, but at least it's got a f***ing roof. So, these cars look completely out of place, contradict their original designs, and worst of all, don't even have a reason to exist. That is the trifecta of awful. The Suzuki Vision GT was later made into a Group 3 race car as well, and again, they didn't put a roof on it. At least this one has an actual purpose. Oh well, I still think they're kind of cool in a weird way, but if Gran Turismo really wants to be taken seriously as the real driving simulator, they need to be trying a little harder than this. So, with their fictional cars, Gran Turismo can do whatever they want with them. They don't exist, so they can just fudge the numbers. But with real cars, they can't get away with that. But that doesn't stop them from trying. Many cars throughout the history of Gran Turismo have had incorrect specs. GT2 is probably the worst offender of this, where cars would even show a certain horsepower in the dealership, and then when you bought it, the power would somehow change. And in some cases, both figures would still be wrong. A common example were the JGTC race cars in GT2. This was back in the days when GT300 and GT500 actually meant something, yet most GT300s had roughly 400 to 450 horsepower, and the GT500s between 600 to 700 horsepower. Ironically, that's not far off what these classes of cars make in current day Super GT. Regardless, given that the numbers were exaggerated for so many cars, it does seem like this was an intentional decision. But in some cases, it was clearly accidental. The Lister Storm debuted in GT2 as well, and it had a racing modification to turn it into the Lister Storm V12 race car. This was all well and good, but in GT3, only the race car made the transition, with the road car being cut, still yet to return to the series. Despite this, the legacy of the Storm road car lived on in the race car not just because it's based on the road car, but because it incorrectly still has the same weight as the road car, 1,438 kilos. The real car, built to GT2 regulations, weighed only 1,100 kilos. What this means is that in GT3, it's noticeably slower than other similar race cars of that era, other GT2 cars, GTS cars, and GT500s. And amazingly, they never fixed this. It carried all the way through to its so far final inclusion in GT6. It went through its entire GT journey, spanning most of the mainline games, 300 kilos overweight. So the Lister Storm was not helped by having more weight than it did in reality. It made it slower and less useful. So surely having less weight or even more power would have the opposite effect right? GT3 saw the debut of the Gilet Vertigo race car. This Belgian racer was built mainly for national GT racing, and in its debut game had 420 horsepower, despite the V6 Alfa Romeo unit it used, never producing more than about 350. Like most race cars in GT3, it didn't have a model year attached to it, but internally was listed as the Vertigo 97, implying it was the 1997 model of the car. However, its 3.6 litre engine and livery with the dolphins on it indicates that it was actually the year 2000 model of the car. Given it's such an obscure car, some of these inconsistencies are understandable, and later in 2001, the real-life Vertigo ran by Belgian Racing would actually be sponsored by Gran Turismo 3. For Gran Turismo 4, the Vertigo would be replaced by the 2004 version of the car, so you'd think this would be their chance to correct these mistakes. Whilst the engine displacement had been increased to 3.8 litres, in GT4, the car now made 900 horsepower. Remember when I said about the GT6 starter car being the biggest video game mystery? Yeah, I changed my answer. Where did they get 900 horsepower from?
No Vertigo, race car or road car, has ever had anything close to 900 horsepower, not even when they started using a Ferrari-derived V8 engine. In real life, it still raced in the G2 class alongside 911 GT3 Cup cars. And this wasn't just a misinput. If you read the in-game description of the car, they genuinely thought it had 900 horsepower. But the power wasn't the only inaccuracy. For example, the name of the car. In 2002, the car was updated to the Vertigo Streff, in deference to former French Formula 1 driver Philippe Streff, which is not reflected in GT4. Also, the livery of the car in-game was never raced in real life. It seems to just be a very obscure show livery. I can't actually find any images of this myself, other than the dealership menu in GT4, which shows the real-life car in a very similar design. But more importantly, what impact did this massive increase in power have on the car in-game? Well, instead of being a moderately fast race car, somewhere between GT300 and GT500 performance as it was in real life, its extremely high power and very low weight meant that it was in the same performance window as the top-end Le Mans prototypes. And that meant you would end up seeing it in events such as Like the Wind and even the GT World Championship. And of course, it would get completely destroyed. Just because it has similar specs to the LMPs doesn't mean it's anywhere near as fast, because it lacks downforce and the chassis just doesn't handle as well. It wasn't impossible to see the car finish last every single time you raced against it. The same would be true for later appearances in GT5 and 6, where in any event it would feature, such as Like the Wind again, it would always be right down the bottom of the results screen. It's sad because I really do like the Vertigo, if only they'd gotten the power more accurate or just kept the version that featured in GT3, it could have been a very solid, lightweight, mid-tier race car. But instead, it just ended up as an overpriced joke. Inaccuracies with cars in Gran Turismo are a lot more common than you might think. Another very excessive example is the Volvo 240 GLT, which is a whopping 600 kilos overweight. The sheer number of mistakes, although some are intentional, is staggering when you look at them in one big list. Thankfully, it's not as common with the newer games after GT6, but again, it's just another quirk of old-school Gran Turismo. Well, here we are. After everything, you're finally in the late game. And what does that mean in Gran Turismo terms? Endurance races. Typically, in the older Gran Turismos, endurance races are supposed to be done later into a playthrough, but in the first three games, the only restriction to enter them was having the necessary license. Now, typically, you would do each of the licenses gradually over the course of a playthrough, but if you wanted to, you could just do all of them immediately, if you were a complete psychopath. And what's clear is that Polyphony didn't really anticipate players doing this, as that's often the key to breaking the progression. For example, what I explained earlier with getting the Skyline Silhouette in GT2, and even the Subaru One Make race from GT4. And endurance races can often play a part in this as well. Even though they tend to require later licenses, some of these races are actually for fairly basic cars. The best example is the Roadster Endurance from GT3, which despite needing the International A license, can be won with your starter car and a set of super hard tyres. And the race itself only takes just over an hour. But because these are classed as late game events, given the license and time investment needed, you can often get some ridiculous prize cars. With the Roadster Endurance, it's a 1 in 4 chance to win a Formula 1 car, like every other Endurance in GT3, which can easily wipe the floor with everything else. And thus, the game has been broken. But if you're looking for a more guaranteed way to break it, then GT2 has got you covered. Over there, you'll find the Trial Mountain 30 Laps Endurance. The opponents are primarily European cars with around 200 horsepower. Again, this could be one with your starter car plus a set of tyres. The only real challenge is the Lotus Elise, which has a chance of turning up, but other than that, it's a walkover. 50 minutes later, you should have a shiny new Denso Saad Supra boasting an unrealistic 700 horsepower. Just about enough to beat any race in the game. As simple as that. Unless you're playing on the NTSCU version 1.0 of the game, because in that case, you may come up against something which you probably weren't expecting to see. The Vector M12 LM Edition. Its 680 horsepower far exceeds the 295 limit for the event. 
But why does this happen? Well, it wasn't intentional. Unlike many other cheating AI cars in GT2, this one was actually caused by a glitch. To put it simply, GT2 uses a global opponent list for events, and due to a car being moved around in this list late in development, it caused some cars to be moved up a spot and end up in events they were never intended to. The endurance races are the worst affected, with the M12 supposed to appear at the Millennium in Rome endurance instead. This glitch was fixed for the later releases of the game, but here it causes some interesting effects. You might think that the Trial Mountain Endurance is now impossible if it turns up, but that's not the case. A few people have shown that it is still beatable within the 295 horsepower limit. Match A155 has a great video demonstrating how the vector can be beaten on tyre strategy, as well as a more in-depth explanation of the glitch itself. I'll link it in the description. The Vector at Trial Mountain is the most well known because it has real ramifications for players since it is now by far the fastest opponent car that can appear in the race. But there are other examples. On the other end of the spectrum we have the Citroen Xantia. The Xantia was the car that got pushed out by the M12 at Trial Mountain where it was supposed to feature and as such ended up in the Special Stage Route 5 All Night Endurance instead. Its opponents are some of the fastest race cars in the game. And no matter how exclusive the Xantia may be, it's not going to go well for it. I'm sure there's some joke you could make about imposter syndrome and being in situations you shouldn't be able to, and how that parallels with getting these insane prize cars, but I'll leave that up to you to figure out. Also, in GT2, the Xantia has a 5-speed transmission, but when it reappeared in GT4 onwards, it has a 4-speed. This is because the V6 exclusive trim was never sold as a 5-speed, only a 4-speed auto. That is in fact the opposite of exclusive. Well, congratulations! By this point, you've pretty much beaten the game. But as you can see, it was far from simple. Throughout this journey, we've encountered some interesting situations and the cars related to those situations. 15 of the cars which I mention in this video are what I consider to be some of the most infamous cars in Gran Turismo history. And that's for all manner of reasons. But what do you think? As I've said in those older GTs, it was all about the unique player experience and deciding what you want to do. You could play through all of these games and still never come across some of the cars I've talked about here, but you'll probably have your own experiences and there'll be cars that stick in your mind as particularly memorable. Whether it was a car that you used or was used against you or any other reason that you might have an attachment, fondness or even hatred towards it, that's kind of what Gran Turismo was all about. So please let me know about these in the comments, and if it was a shared experience or just something that's personal to you, I'd love to know either way. Just because these are virtual representations of machines doesn't mean that they're completely emotionless, because it's all about the experience you have with them, and of course how the game is designed to allow you to have those experiences. That is what Gran Turismo means to me. Have a good one.